Okay, you can turn in your Bible to 1 John chapter 3. Will there be a final purification of the church before the catching away of the body of Christ? I believe the answer to that is yes. Let me show you why. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. You seem like a stranger to the world, don't you? The world seems strange to you. Yes, it does. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but, when we, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I do believe that we will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I think we're going to look like him. But look at verse 3. And every man that hath this hope, the catching away of the body of Christ, hath this hope in him, purifieth himself even as he is pure. You know, I just uh, got a letter. I'm going to tell you this real quickly. I got a letter here today and um, I have some, I can't tell who they are because I don't want people coming here and things. It's just a story. I'm trying to illustrate a point. Stick with me. And there's some royalty coming, and they're going to be here tomorrow night. So, um, actually, you know what? No, that was yesterday. I got the thing. Yeah, they'll be here tonight. They're going to be here in about, maybe eh, probably about 15 minutes. So, uh, yeah, I just, I just uh, really not going to bother taking a shower. Not really going to fix the place up or anything else. And, uh, um, meh, yeah, you know, whatever. So you, you would do that? Let me make it even better. Jesus Christ, I get an angel showing up and the angel says, Jesus Christ is going to dine at your house tomorrow night. What would you do to get ready for it? Uh, you would certainly take a shower, probably get your hair cut, get some new clothes or whatever else, or, or some your cleanest, best clothes that you have. You'd have your house spick and span. You'd be you know, best food that you could possibly afford, you'd put your best out for Jesus Christ, wouldn't you? You would uh, purify your life. If you knew he was physically going to be coming tomorrow night. Um, Jesus is coming. Maybe not tomorrow night, but he's coming for his bride. You're going to purify yourself? I mean, think about that. Verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. How would you like to have a guy that in him is no sin coming to your house and sitting down and he can read your thoughts? Oh, he would just have grace because he knows, you know, that I'm I'm just wicked, and he just, you know, he wouldn't care and whatever else. Don't tell me you'd feel comfortable sitting there with the Lord Jesus Christ, and you just letting your thoughts just go random. You'd want to purify yourself. Verse six: Whosoever abideth in Him sinneth not; whosoever sinneth hath not seen Him, neither known Him. Sinneth not? I know this is a big debate thing back and forth. Well, is it talking about technically, you know, his righteousness is imputed to you, so your sins are not charged to you, and blah, blah, blah. That's not what the text is saying. And again, you get the little philosophical, easy believers in people. Well, it's impossible to live without sin and all this stuff. You're teaching sinless perfectionism and all this other. Yeah, they're doing that because they're living in wicked sin and they don't want to get rid of it. A Christian is supposed to fight sin. Does it mean you're going to be sinlessly perfect? Of course not. You understand that. But if you got some porn magazines and you got some alcohol and you got some cigarettes over there and you got some profanity and you like like to watch some dirty movies and things once in a while, and I'm using those all those things, it's you know obviously wicked stuff. I mean, there are a lot other things that Christians do that are, that's wicked. You know, and you need to get rid of that. If you're doing all that stuff, you need to get rid of it. You don't say, well, Christians struggle with sin. We all struggle with sin. So I'm, 
I'm going to keep all this stuff around and say I'm struggling with it. It's not how it works. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Rest of the verse there. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Can God help you to get away from sin? Yes, he can. But see, here's the whole thing. This whole modern movement of easy believism and, stuff, and, and there's no repentance, there's no turning from sin, there's no changed life and all this other stuff. It's all a spirit behind this thing that's getting you to take a lighter attitude towards sin. I wonder who that spirit could be. Would God's Holy Spirit come in and say, uh, take a lighter attitude towards sin. Oh, don't feel so bad about that. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Think about that. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And again, there you have that imputed righteousness. I understand that. You know, your sins are paid for. I get that. But you don't take that and say, okay, then I don't have to fight sin. I don't have to clean my life up. That's the issue here. Verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. All right, and certainly that's true. But uh, we have this warped idea of love being tolerance. Um, love is not tolerance. Okay, love is not compromise. There's charity. Understand that uh, you could certainly fall and you could get messed up and whatever else, uh, and something that some brother or sister's messed up in. So you have some charity there. Um, but the whole point is. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And when you get some brother or sister that's messing around with sin and you tolerate it, you're not really showing love. Love, let me show you a good example of it here. Let me just, just this one popped into my mind here. Lord put this in my head, I'll say it that way. I don't want to make it sound like I'm taking credit from the Lord. Give you a good one here. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which, work, which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. But look at this. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. True love is saying, I'm noting you and I'm not going to have any company with you until you get that thing fixed up. Until I see some genuine repentance there. You get some guy that commits adultery, some young guy that commits fornication and whatever else, and you say, come on in. Oh, sit beside my daughter over here. I don't think so. Oh, uh, walk over there and sit beside my little boy sitting over there. You say you've had struggles with uh, sodomy or struggles with whatever. Yeah, just sit there by my son. No, I don't think so. Get out. You are a fornicator. You are... An adulterer, you are this, you are that, out. Purify, you see? That's how it's supposed to be. But let me show you another good thing, another neat tie-in here. Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, verse 25 through 28. 
Let's read that. Some really good key scripture type of stuff here. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Remember that. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. The tribe of Levi, those that were handling the word of God. Hmm. Almost like you could call those the Bible-believing of the Jewish world. The Bible-believing Jews, so to speak. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. The guys that knew the book, the guys that handled the word of God, they came over and they said, we're on your side. You a Bible-believing Christian? Are you on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Come up hither. No tie-ins, of course. Verse 27, And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day around 3,000 men. Hmm. Um... I don't want to judge you, brother. I, I don't, I don't, I, let's, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. And I, I, I think, you know, maybe you should, you know, no, go in there and say, you're messing around in adultery? Wham! Sorry. Put away from among, among yourselves that wicked person. Hey, you're not working? Wham! Hit them. Hey, you're a young woman dressing immodestly? Wham! Put every man his sword by his side. You see? Purify the body of Christ. How? By judging according to the word of God. Why? Because you love the brethren. Tolerance for sin is not love. We need to raise the standards. This standard, the word of God, it's above all the junk down here. The rest of all the worldly books and everything else that's down here. The new versions and all the philosophers and everything else. It's the book. The only connection that we have, physical connection that we really have to the Lord Jesus Christ is His Word. Well, it doesn't matter which version you use. You're deceived. You're very deceived. We need to have a standard. Not many standards which we prefer, or I don't prefer, or whatever else. The body of Christ will never be unified if we have multiple standards. We need one book. A book that's been proven for over 400 years. The King James Bible and no other. What about that naked thing? Aaron made them naked? Turn to Revelation chapter 3. If you've been in the Word for a while, you know where I'm going. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. You say, well, that's just talking to the church of Laodicea that's in the first century. It's just there and, it's, and there's no application for today. Cracks me up. I've heard non-dispensationalists say that. They attack dispensational believers and they'll say, you just cut out whole parts of the Bible and say, that's not for me. That's not for me. And then they turn right around. These, these fools, they turn right around and they say, this is just to local churches. It's, it has no application to today. Excuse me? You know, all Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Somehow they miss that. 
And I've been rebuked for years about this thing. You know, I say, well, you know, this is seven types of churches, seven church periods and whatever. Oh, it's seven local churches, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it's actually instruction in righteousness. And there's doctrinal things here and some reproof that you're getting right now. And correction. I know thy works. Read this already, but I want to make a point. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Lord would have you be one way or another. Not compromising, tolerant, and all this other stuff. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's a scary thing. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Aaron made the people naked. Moses, God's servant, comes along and he says, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come to me. And he comes, those sons of Levi, and they come and he, they say, What should we do? He says, Take your sword. Put it by your side and go on out there and start purifying. Wham! That's what the church needs right now. You say, well, Brother Brian, the, the, you know, I have relatives that are in the modern charismatic church. They're laid of sin. No, they're lost. You know, for years I was teaching the whole thing of, uh, you know, Laodicean is like the modern, like Rick Warren and Hillsong and all this. I don't believe that way. I believe those are just lost people. I think lukewarm Christians are among Bible believers. I think we all have that tendency to kind of want to get lukewarm once in a while. To kind of want to pretty up the gospel. The foolishness, you know, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them to perish. Well, I don't want to make it foolish anymore. You know, um, um, uh, let's just kind of make it attractive and and you know, kind of do like the 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 soft little thing. And Jesus died for you, and God loves you. He has a plan for you. <laughs> uh, no, actually, um, our Savior was a homeless Jewish carpenter, and he's naked up there on the cross, and people making fun of him, spitting on him ripping out his beard before he's, you know, up there on the cross and things down there. People there going, ha ha, look at him. You know, he saved others. He can't save himself. Ha ha, they're probably loser. How do I get to heaven? Believe on that. Homeless Jewish carpenter up there, naked, people laughing at him, making fun of him, dying in agony and pain. That's how you get to heaven. Huh? What? Huh? What? what? Well, then what? I believe in, you know, put my faith in him. Then what do I do? Well, then he tells you what to do through a book that's uh, 400 plus years old. Let's pretty it up. Let's, uh, we got to make it hip and trendy here, you know. We got to have the, uh, the green Bible, you know, recycled. Recycled. It's green. It's green. It's made out of recycled paper. You know, how about uh, we get, uh, trying to see a good one here. Oh yeah, here's a good one. You know, let's, let's do the message remix. Oh, isn't that attractive? Look at that artistic cover with the beautiful wooden boards and everything else. Satanic garbage. Oh, well, brother, I, I, you, you could really offend somebody, you know. Good. Good. I want to offend people. You know, I'm real sick and tired of these people that still stand for the new versions. It disgusts me. It's been proven over and over and over. Probably for a hundred years now. Yeah, if you go back to Dean John William Bergen, it's been over a hundred years of people coming out and saying the new versions are wicked. They're from the Vatican. You still have people going, well, I just don't think, you know, I just think that there are brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> The King James Bible is the Word of God in the English-speaking world. And if you don't believe that, you're not right with God. If you're defending the new versions, anything that comes from the Vatican, then you might as well just say, hey, I'm all for the thing of the priests raping children. 
Why not? You, are, you support the Bibles that come from those people. I've showed in my real Bible version issue exposed online for free on this channel in multiple parts and on the secondary channel as the full thing. High definition, the whole deal. And I show the quotes from the Council of Trent. I show the things from Vatican II where they're saying, let's work together with separated brethren to create new Bible versions. I show the thing, the making of the NIV, where they say we created part of the translation at the University of Salamanca in Spain and a Catholic nuns are running the thing where the translators of the NIV are working on it. And I show that it's just like, well, yeah, but you know, eh. I'm not going to argue with people if they use a new version. Then you're not right with God. You're lukewarm. You make God sick. Who's on the Lord's side? Verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. When the Lord returns, is he going to find you worshiping idols down there naked? Looking like the world? Or are you going to have the righteousness of Jesus Christ on you? Are you going to be living holy and separate, clean compared to the lost world? How's it going to be? Verse 19. You say, Brian, you're, you're, you're sure just don't, you don't have any love. You're not smiling. <laughs> you know, <laughs> here, I'll smile. See, I'm smiling. Now I love people. <laughs> It'll make me vomit. Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Are you going to be zealous? Jesus Christ is coming. Are you going to purify your life? Are you going to get cleaned up with the washing of water by the word? Is there junk in your life that needs to go? Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. How about it? He's knocking. What is it that opens up here in uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1? And after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Jesus said, I am the door. John chapter 10. What if he's up there in heaven looking down, kind of like through the window of the door, and he's just kind of looking down? What if the Lord is waiting for the church to purify itself? I mean, if the rapture happened tonight, um, would people understand why you left if you're a Christian? But they say, well, I hear people saying it was this rapture thing or something, they're catching away, you know. I, I hear people saying it was the catching away, you know. It, it, why would they have left? They were no different than me. Or they say, oh, I don't care what happened, I'm just glad to get rid of old Holy Joe over here. Why, sure, I'm glad. The person's always there, always judging my sins, always judging this and judging that, always carrying their Bible around. They got things on their vehicle and bumper magnets and stuff. You got behind this nut the one time, you know. I remember I was at a hardware store the one time up in uh, Eldred, or not up, excuse me, down, <laughs> way down in Pennsylvania. And I had my truck out there and I had my, you know, Bible magnets on it and stuff. And this guy comes in, I'm at another part of the store and I hear him saying to the woman behind the cash register, he goes, hey, and I hear him laughing about my truck and he goes, yeah, he goes, it just kind of reminds me of the old saying, some people are all mixed up. And he said that, you know, Christians are like concrete, all mixed up and set in their ways. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm glad for that. I find that to be honorable. Verse 21. So what's my motivation? Why should I get cleaned up? Why should I purify myself? 
because of the precious promises of God's Word, God's book. Verse 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What a great promise. Are you going to overcome? Are you going to purify yourself? So, well, Brother Brian, the rest of the world sure is getting dirty, isn't it? The transgendered thing, they're sure getting dirty. All this sodomy stuff and everything else. You know, I was, I was up at a Kmart in uh, Madawaska, Maine. A lot of you are going, what, Madawata? <laughs> Madawaska. It's one of the four corners of America. The four northeasternmost corner of America is the town of Madawaska. They actually have a little park called Four Corners Park. And they got this Kmart there, and they're like, there used to be one up a little bit above us in Presque Isle, and then they shut that thing down. So we got to drive the whole way up there now. We don't go to Walmart. hate Walmart. But uh, that's another story. And so we're up there, and there's this thing working there. And, it, you know, I looked at it, and at first I thought it was a woman, and I looked, and I'm like, oh, okay. Transgendered pervert, you know. I'm just like, ugh. And I, thankfully my son didn't see it or anything else, and I'm just terrible. Little town out in the middle of nowhere, you know. And I know some of you are seeing it all the time. It's very, very, very vexing. You say, uh, well, yeah, it's really getting dirty out there, brother, and oh, my life is just so vexing and just all this and that and everything else. Well, I understand being vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked like Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah, but you know what? It should, want, it should make you want to get cleaned up. That's what I was going to say. It should make you want to be different. You shouldn't say, well, the world's going bad, so, you know, well, I guess if I get a little bit bad, it's, you know, at least I'm a little bit better than they are. Uh-uh. It should make you go the opposite direction. The world's going this way. You better go that way. Higher standards. John chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. We'll close here with this. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying... If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. I find it interesting how it starts out. In the last day. Huh. That great day of the feast. Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Do you thirst for righteousness? Do you thirst for true holiness? Do you thirst to be purified when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality do you thirst to have a sinless body not even any tempted you're going to a place where there is no sin do you thirst for that let him come unto me and drink Let the Lord open your understanding. Let the Lord get into your life, into the most innermost recesses of your life and tell you what to clean up. You know? Cleaning yourself and everything else. The Lord says, hey, uh, right behind the ear. You go, huh? You missed a spot right there. There's some dirt behind the ear. Hey, uh, put your arm up. Oh, this needs to be cleaned up and that needs to be cleaned up. Goes through your house and he says, this needs to go, that needs to go, that needs to go. Get rid of that thing. You shouldn't have this thing here and that thing in there. You're going to be open to that? Do you thirst for righteousness? Do you thirst for holiness? Verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that had, or they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Um, has the Holy Ghost been given to you, Christian? Yes. Then what excuse do you have for keeping sin around? For remaining dirty? When the Lord says, purify yourself. What if the reason that the rapture hasn't happened yet is because Christ's church has not purified itself? 
because we're putting up with sin. Well, I don't want to tell people that they need to get rid of their television, and I don't want to tell women to dress modestly, and I don't want to tell people that, you know, to abstain from alcohol and things like that if you're getting drunk with it and whatever else. All that stuff. All these different things. You say, well, brother, I believe that the trigger for the rapture is going to be that last soul that gets saved. Well, how is there going to be a last soul that gets saved when we're so dirty and filthy? Hey, Catholic, you want to get saved? Come on over here. It's safe over here. Oh, wait, yeah. Baptist, King James only preachers and things like this molesting children. Oops, sorry. You know, the brother that I dealt with the, the years ago and stuff requested prayer and things like that. And, and a lot of you helped out, you know, with his legal case and things, financially helping to put the, you know, Baptist pervert preacher in prison, you know. And he said, there were, there were people, members of the church that were coming to him and saying, why didn't you go to the pastor privately? The guy molested his two daughters, eight-year-old girls, and the people were going, you should have come to him privately. Why did you have to make a big thing of this? You see? That's what's going on. And I see this thing all the time in the body of Christ. And it's just like, well, brother so-and-so, they use the King James Bible and, and they're, they're, you know, they're, they may be off in a few things. Stop watching them. Let's raise the standards higher. We have to raise the standards higher. That's the only way to purify the church. I mean, or, or let's just keep wasting our time and just keep taking a light attitude towards sin so we can stay on this earth longer. That's a brilliant idea. Oh, it's so vexing out there to see the world and things. Yes, I know. Let's purify the church so we can leave. So we can get that last person right. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. Are we going to purify ourselves? Stand up and say, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Take your sword. Get it by your side. Who needs to be whacked with it? Raise the standards higher. So, <laughs> that's going to be it for my little four different sermon notes there, you know. And next I have uh, a Christian will not, dot, dot, dot. And I have nine things that a Christian will not do. Because I'm seeing this thing all the time, you know, Christian, you know, I'm a Christian and I do these different things. So I'm going to be doing that sermon, you know, maybe not tonight or whatever else, but it's going to be, in the future it's going to be released, maybe next week or something, I don't know, whenever. But we need to, we need to set some standards all right? As Bible-believing Christians, we need to set some strong standards. And if you, know, if you know somebody that's messing around with things, you let me know, okay? You see somebody down in the comments, and they're playing the little game and everything else, and I'm a, oh, praise the Lord, brother, and oh, I'm praying for you, sister, and I'm praying blah, 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 and all this other stuff, and you know that they're messing around in sin, let me know, all right? And I'll start going after him. And I want to know. I want to know who's on the Lord's side. Who's willing to take up the sword of the Spirit and not compromise. Who's willing to say, I want to be part of purifying Christ's church. The real church. I'm not talking about Catholicism. That's Satan's church. I'm talking about people that are going to be willing to take a stand for the Bible no matter what it costs them. And say, I want to be pure. I don't want to stink when the Lord takes me out of here. I don't want to be Laodicean, neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm. And let it begin in my house. Let the Lord say to me, let the Holy Spirit of God come to, into my life and look at every single nook and cranny of me and say, that needs to go, that needs to change. That's what we all need. I think we're going to be here until the church is purified. And as we purify the church and we get smaller in number, we get stronger. And then that there's people out there that are watching right now and they're saying, I don't know if I want to join this thing because I'm afraid that they're going to just compromise and they're going to this and they're going to that. 
they see that thing of these are real people. And I'm not going to be able to get in their midst and, and act like I'm a Christian. They'll spot me if I'm a fake, if I'm a fraud. These people look for a changed life. And if they don't see it, you're out. And then and only then are we going to get the real converts, the real Christians, those people that believe in holiness and righteousness and turning from sin. Still struggling, not sinlessly perfect, still struggling with sin, but fighting it on a daily basis. So that is going to be it. I really do pray that these sermons have challenged some of you out there that are on the fence about different things and are just kind of going, well, you know, and stuff. We need to set our standards high. And we need to go after people with the sword of the Spirit. I pray that you open yourself up to the Lord and you say, Lord, what is it that needs to be cleaned up? I want to be pure when you come. I want to be purified. I want to be acceptable when you as you're knocking on that door and saying, I want to come in and sup with you. I don't want to have to feel ashamed with you dealing with me. I pray you do that today.